Claude Michel and Alain, thank you very much for joining us in what must be a very busy time for you as you prepare for the opening of Miss Saigon in the West End or the reopening of Miss Saigon uh, in the West End. Firstly, how does it feel 25 years on to be to be back in the West End in a in a different theatre, but but with this show? Well, it doesn't feel like it was 25 years ago. First, uh, time flies, as we always say, but. Also because it's a reinvention of the show, it's not a revival. So the pressure is the same as the first time around, the excitement is the same, the emotions that we're getting on first previews is enormous, uh, the people seem to love the show, but more important than that, the people who come to see the show were not born where we were presenting the show the first time around. So. Uh, it's a complete new generation of people who are coming with their, their parents or without their parents. They just seem to love the Saigon uh, from what they've been hearing about it from their parents or because they have been performing it maybe at school or at the university. I don't know, but there is a complete, complete new uh, brand of people who are coming uh, to see the Saigon and that is really uh, rejuvenating, exciting, and more. It's, for us, we are very proud to be back in, in the West End because we had a more than 10 years run at the Drury Lane and uh, to have such a success with the revival of the show, it's the best proof that our original work had a good value. So that's why we are particularly very proud to, to have the show back and to see the, the audience, the reaction of the audience every night. One difference between then and now is, of course, then you didn't know that it was going to go on to become this, this worldwide success. You didn't know it was going to be a hit. Whereas now, of course, the, the show has proven itself to, to be popular uh, with, with so many people. Does that lend a certain pressure to to revisiting it does it does it but you know hits uh come and go uh this one seems to be enduring and uh what's really uh makes us so proud about about it and, and so excited about it coming back in the to the west end is because seeing that the show was missed looks like from the enthusiasm from the people who want to see it and from the kind of advanced booking that this new version is getting, uh, it seems that the show has been missed in, in London and uh, that makes us even prouder of having written it on our own, you know, to, when we were the two of us 25 years ago and we were just starting to write the first uh, notes and words of what would become the Saigon. And to find, fortunately, uh, a bold producer who, Cameron McIntosh, obviously, who accepted to put on the stage uh, GI singing at the beginning of a story about the Vietnam, which was happening during the last days of the Vietnam War. And at the same time, of course, you can have a success with a musical show, but you don't know because the musical was on fashion in this time, or is it timeless? And we hope that with the success of the show as still today, that we created something a little bit timeless, timeless, and uh, that we survive even ourselves. So that's very gratifying to think about it, that it's not a show considered a good success, but a little bit on fashion. There's a wonderful clip on YouTube of, of you both in 1989 auditioning Leia Salonga. Who of course, 1988. 1988, just before the, the opening of the original show, of course, um, who at the time was completely unknown uh, and has gone on to prove herself a, a stupendous talent. Did it, was it a similar experience this time round when you were looking for the new cast to bring the show back to the West End? It was not the same experience because... At this time, we didn't know if somebody like Lea existed. And after with the running of the show in England, over the world, in the US and in Asia, we knew that there were a lot of teams. So we knew that we can add a complete cast on stage. 
because before we didn't know at all if it was possible to have a cast uh, 80 percent or 70 percent of Asian who can sing on Broadway or in the West End. We were not sure at all. And thanks God and thanks to the Philippines, we found it. This time we knew that we can have a cast. What we didn't know that we, we will have another miracle uh, with Eva. The same uh, sparkle of uh, suddenly uh, big luck coming, uh, having with finding Eva the same way we found Leah. And Anna was there in New York when she auditioned the first time. Uh, so, of course, it's amazing because you never think it's going to happen to you twice that you're going to find such a young girl, so you don't have to compromise the idea that you would be 23 playing 16 or 17. Uh, you know, with a voice uh, which ranges to the high sea and, uh, and who can act. And, uh, and Eva Nobelzada is a wonderful actress as well as an incredible singer. And another difference this time round is, is your director, Lawrence Connor. What, what do you think he's, uh, he's brought to this production? But it's not, we don't have a production coming out of the blue as a new production. All this is part of a chain of different production. And Lawrence has been involved with, but it started a very long time ago when we had a new production on tour in the US, in England, we even had a production in, in Hungary with a new vision of the set. We inspired a lot of people after, and Matt Kinley and Mitchell Lemsky from the US, they were rethinking the show, but that I'm talking about six, seven years ago. And slowly there was an evolution of the set, of the helicopter scenes, of everything, and finally, we have this version, which may be the ultimate version of this vision of the show. But it has been improving production after production, but it's a very long process. And it's not suddenly somebody telling, ah, I have a new idea, that's what, how we're going to do with Saigon. It's a slow and uh, very, uh, very unique process. And there is also a new team lighting, new lighting designer, there is a, a new set designer, there's a new projection designer, because the show now includes projections, uh, which are very, very powerful during the helicopter scene, especially. Uh, you know, Lawrence has been able, together with Cameron, have been discussing this show over the years, a lot of times, and they have been putting together a complete new team of people who, together with the old team, which includes Bob Avian, the choreographer, Jeff Garrett, uh, the other choreographer, and uh, Andrea ne Neofitu, the costume designer, uh, makes an extraordinary cocktail and gives birth to a show which, once again, is not a revival, it's a recreation. <laughs> One uh, big change in terms of the score is the addition of a new song, Maybe, which is sung by Ellen, played by Tamsin Carroll. Um, can you firstly talk us through the, the genesis of that song? What, what prompted you to, to write it? Well, I think that the first idea of... We never were very happy with any of the songs. We had already tried three different songs from the character of Ellen from the beginning. Uh, one of them never reached the stage and and two of them have been sung uh, one after the other uh, in the previous incarnation of the Saigon and I think one day it was Cameron who came up and say, and said to us look uh, I still think we don't have the right song for Miss Saigon think about it and Claude Michel started to think uh, about it and came up with 
this idea that maybe the song di didn't have to be definitive of a character of an American girl who would just want her husband back and nothing else and wouldn't care about the other girl to uh, a song in which she would have some doubts which explain why the song is called Maybe. And from there on, the melody came up quite quickly, if I remember. Yes, it, it, it came because the song was only about some, somebody having question mark, not being sure about her, herself, would give some fragility to Ellen, that what she didn't have before. And we thought that the fact that she's doubting about the situation make her it a bit more pleasant or sympathical to to see. And that was the problem we had with the character, that she was only the troublemaker in the situation and didn't have a, 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 a good heart. And what not, she was not a real uh, person. So the, the question mark aspect was very important in the creation of the song. And, and Tamsin does it full justice. Then. Tamsin yeah. does it now full justice. Poor girl, she's been assaulted with different lyrics. Over the, over the last two, two or three months. Uh, and uh, she's making it hers. I mean, she's making it a scene. She's making it very theatrical. And this song could be done in several ways. You can even think of it like, more or less, uh, a pop song, let's say, uh, between inverted commas. But uh, what she does wonderfully well, she does it very theatrically, and she integrates it in that very heartbreaking moment of the hotel scene in the Saigon, which starts up, uh, starts with the discovery of Kim's suffering, uh, coming to the help room and you know meeting Ellen face to face, and finishes with the nervous breakdown of of, of Chris a few minutes later. So the song is compressed in between all that, making it a 10 minute uh, emotional roller coaster at that moment of the show, just before we, we, we go to the American Dream, which is like a, a moment of relief, not for long, but, but a moment of relief. So she certainly does it wonderfully. Um, you recently, of course, enjoyed an enormous success with the screen, the, the, the cinema version of Les Miserables. There have been many... We don't know yet. <laughs> You're going to cut me off at the pass on that one. Well, that's fair no, enough. There is nothing to say we don't know. Yet. Okay. Um, well, I'll ask you a, a, a more theatrical question, which is uh, there have also, there's also been talk of uh, revivals of uh, Martin Guerre, for example. I... Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a bit premature, but it's yeah. not a secret that uh, Claude Michel and I have been reworking for, for, for the last two years on, on re thinking completely about that, yeah? and trying to start from what we have. And what we think we have is a very powerful score, uh, which many people think is one of sometimes their favorite scores from all the musicals we've been, we've been writing. Uh, but at the same time, we know that it hasn't found its definitive form. We, we are still struggling well, I hope not anymore, but we have been struggling for the last two years with how to reorganize this show, this story, which is very difficult because it's story about ambiguity, about lies, about anti-heroes who you must present at the end of the evening, like the heroes of a story uh, which you want to enjoy spending the evening with them. So there are a lot of parameters which are completely different from a story which is a little more black and white. So we really enjoyed and worked through that process again, got rid of what we thought was useless to, to, to telling this story in a musical and tried to get to the heart of the matter, which is that love story between these two people, except that the two men are, you know, the, the one man are two. It's, it's, you know, it adds a little bit of spice and complication to how to tell the story. I think we are not far from having what we think is our ideal version of Martin Guerre, but it's a little too early to speak about the new production. We are still writing it. Well, that's very encouraging to hear. Saigon, uh, similarly to, uh, to Les Miserables, it certainly stood the test of time. Uh, what 
do you think it is about these two shows in particular that has caught the popular imagination? Frankly, I think mainly is the book and the story. Uh, for Les Miserables, we had a very famous novel by Victor Hugo, who, who has been already a big success when he was released in 1862. For Miss Saigon, we had the opera work by Puccini, Man and Butterfly, and we know it's a very heart-breaking story. And at the end of the day, I think that when we are writing a show, despite the fact that we are a kind of uh, eternal student, a little bit intellectual in our approach, in the way we are living and in our style of life, when we are writing a show, we're trying to be very honest with the story we have to, to tell. Uh, in terms of lyrics and music, we are honest and we give the maximum of ourselves. And we try to be... Uh, true to the spirit of the of the of Les Miserables. As I used to say, you can't pro, you can't do a Les Miserables with a minimum of uh, actor or stage, a minimized, a minimized version of Les Mis. It's impossible because the book itself is somebody bigger than life. And with when you're talking about Vietnam War and love and people being shattered by the war, you have to be honest and to to tell exactly what you feel inside and what your statement uh, uh, about the story, about the war, about the, uh, the persecution and, and, and the story of the people and simple people too caught in the middle of the war. And that can happen everywhere in the world and still does. Mm. Yeah. Um, we had quite an interesting question from a reader through Twitter, which was... Uh, Many of your shows are often cited by other composers as shows that they they wish they'd written. But um, but which uh, which musical do you uh, do you do you wish you had written? What, what what's your favourite of the? Um, I have an answer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, think I wish we had written West Side Story. <laughs> I wish I would have written Showboat, just to have written the the song Old Man River. But we are, choosing, we are choosing, not by accident, two shows which cross over the, your previous question is this show, the people who wrote this show were not external to the story they were trying to tell on that stage. They were not writing about entertainment. They were not trying to make an entertaining evening. They were not only involved, I think they were identifying themselves to one or two or three of the characters of the story they were telling. And this is exactly what happens to us. For two or three years, I can be Kim or I can be Chris another evening. He can feel like Javert or he can be Valjean another night. We, we are completely involved and identified, I think, with the characters we are trying to describe. Or we wouldn't be able to write about them. Um, and on that note, I have to ask if, uh, if you are still writing together and, and have any plans for for shows in the future? For shows, I don't know. We have enough to do with Smart Tiger at the moment. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're working on at this mm -hmm. moment. And, it, and believe me, it's a huge job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it will take another yeah. length of time <laughs> before being finished. Um, and just finally, as a... Uh, uh, what would you say as, as, as an invocation to to that new generation who may not know Miss Saigon or certainly may not know more than a, a couple of the, 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 the big songs. What, what would you say to them to entice them to, to come and see, uh, to, to come and see this, this production at the, uh, at the Prince Edward? That it's only a show about love between two young people shattered by the war and uh, about the sacrifice of uh, a mother for, for a child. And as I said, when we said before, this happening today in uh, Syria, in Libya, in Ukraine, maybe. And uh, every day you have a, a lot of boats on the Sicilia coast with refugees from Africa. And that's what the show is all about. People wanted to have a better life, a good life that the engineer uh, uh, 
soul and what he thinks it's to go to the West, to go to America. Kim, she's sacrificing herself for the future of the of, of a child. So it's universal and timeless and pleasing. And at the same time, I hope that they have a, a, a cool evening with a lot of uh, big values in the production, and because that's the story we are telling, and we're not inventing; it's true stories. The most heartbreaking moment in the Saigon, I think, to me when I watch it every evening, more or less, is is that end of Act One, the boat people. When we're writing that, we thought we we're writing a story about Vietnam. You know, no one had heard about boat people except that some people were paying $1,000, $2,000, anything they have, giving any money, any clothes, any anything that they had, certainly all their savings, a life savings, to cross that ocean that's why we foam, you know, and, and try to get to the other side. The problem is that this has become an everyday story in every corner of the globe, and that's very saddening. That's very, very sad. So sometimes, you know, the fact that it was an example and has not stopped there is something difficult to cope with.